It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Welcome to Tuesday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Giants. So glad you could join us today for the next hour. I'm Paul Dottino, two-time Super Bowl champ Jonathan Casillas with me this afternoon. We're going to talk Giants football. We've got rookie camp coming up on Friday. Yeah, it's, it's here already as we continue to move through the offseason schedule and figure out exactly what the Giants are doing to prepare for the 2024 season. Our phone number, and we invite you to call in. Want to take a lot of phone calls today. 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513. We'll be here for the next hour. You can also go hashtag Giants Chat on Twitter if you prefer. And as a reminder, you can always find an archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere at Giants.com slash podcast. Jonathan, I think for me, the starting point here, since this is your uh, one appearance of the week and the only time this week on the program that we'll have a former player uh, co-hosting, I think it's probably pretty cool to, to get some of your reflections and also some of your perceptions as to what rookie minicamp is about. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know the Giants made their six draft selections a little over a week ago. Guys had some time to digest it, get their families kind of acclimated to what's going on. Uh, guys have flown in. They've met everybody. They flew back. They got some of their belongings. Now they got to come back and they got to get ready because on Friday they will report for rookie minicamp. Now, I know we were talking before the show, you were injured your rookie season. So I know some of your perspectives will be a little bit different than what these guys have. But what what is it like for that week leading into the rookie minicamp for these young players who are going to set foot on the field for the first time wearing a professional uniform. Because I have to imagine, regardless of their confidence, there are butterflies. Oh, 100%. A hundred percent. And my uh, situation was a little interesting because I was hurt basically after my senior year. Uh, I did a little bit just try to put some out there before the combine but when I showed up I was still hurt you know really so I still had to you know rehab the knee I had surgery on going uh finishing my senior year so I was out but this is something that scared every single person this is before we even played any type of football whatsoever we did anything rookie mini camp we did anything one of the quarterbacks that was uh, picked up I think it was a undrafted guy from UCLA you know, we didn't even do rookie minicamp yet. We were just, like, getting in the building. He he already got cut. So, like, we seen him on our way in, and he was sitting on his bags. And I was confused about it, you know? And, and I was like, what is, like what's, where are you going, bro? Like, we we got to do something later. He already got cut. Before the rookie B minicamp? Before, yeah, anything like really, really, really got going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the rookie's been in already, right? Like, they already been in the building, right? Well, not yet. Here, so you know what? It was right after the rookie mini camp. It was right, it was right after, after the rookie okay. mini camp. So at yeah. least he had gotten on. He the got field. to the he got to the rookie mini camp. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank so, goodness right, he got right, on right. the field. Right, right, right. My bad, my bad. So he actually got on the field, but you know, still, it's still, but before training camp and all that stuff. Yeah. So that that shocked everybody. But you know, the rookie mini camp, I wasn't participating in it. But what I did see, and and I didn't know it because that's my first year as well. The pace, they don't know pace. You know, they're coming in and they think they got to be 100 miles per hour from the first go. Like, there are legit walkthroughs in the NFL. that I'm not saying it doesn't happen in college, but when you are a college guy and you get drafted or you're a free agent, whatever, free agent, uh, uh, you know, like me, I was a free agent uh, from the draft, mm -hmm. signing right after the draft. When you come in, like you said, the butterflies are there, you know, your your you know, your nerves are there and you know, you want to go out and put on your best Im impression. You don't want to never get beat by nobody. So, you go out there, you're running 100 miles per hour in the walkthrough. Like I remember them kept telling <laughs> I remember them kept telling the guys like you, you I got to relax as a walkthrough. And then they kind of just let it go for a little bit. And then the following week when the when the veterans got in and you seen the right. pace change, it was like, "Oh, a walkthrough is literally a walkthrough. There's nobody running." So, it's such a learning curve and the the nerves being there too. 
Nobody wants to be caught walking on the field. Nobody wants to be caught, you know, not playing at a high speed. So they're a little bit turned up a little bit too much uh, in rookie minicamp. Mm -hmm. We've often heard that the first impression is the most important impression. So how difficult it, I, I, I don't want to say pressure because everybody has their own pressure, but how difficult is it for a rookie who's going to walk out to the field for the first time, not necessarily a draft pick, but an undrafted guy specifically, he walks out there on Friday for the first time and he's probably like literally, I would think, as tight as a drum, not wanting to miss a direction, mm -hmm. not wanting to misunderstand a direction, uh, making sure he's exactly on time. Yep. I mean, every T crossed, every I dotted for fear that that could be the thing that sends you home. Yeah, it, it was a, it, it was definitely something that was on everybody's mind uh, when I was coming out as a rookie in New Orleans in 2009. And, you know, it, it, but rightfully so, though, you know, like you because it is a professional business and, you know, leaving the collegiate ranks where, you know, you played with, you know, not the best players in the world. But, you know, this is the cream of the crop I came from Division One. You play with, with the cream of the crop guys, you know, you know, all throughout the country. And then you get to the league. Now you take that cream of the crop guys and you shave off the top of that. And it's the, <laughs> it's the, really the cream of the crop. And you go in and, and you know, it, it is tight, but. If I can give these guys any type of, you know, uh, uh, advice in any type of way, I think the best thing what what you need to do is going in, you need to show them that you can you can learn. You know, picking up the playbook before you even go out there, you know, and then also if you make a mistake, don't make the same mistake again. And then, you know, let your athletic ability speak for itself when you fully understand what you're doing. And maybe you don't fully understand it, but at least you have a good grasp over it because they don't put too much on the rookies. You know, it's not, mm -hmm. they're not getting the whole playbook. They're getting maybe a tenth of the playbook. So they're trying to see how fast these guys can play. Also, they want to see their natural ability. So they don't want to have them thinking too much. So you should be able to get that playbook down. And if you're struggling getting that very, very, very limited playbook, I think that's very alarming, you know, for these right. coaches because it's very vanilla. It's very vanilla here. And they're doing basic cover two, cover three stuff, four, five man front. Like they're not mixing it up too much in, 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 you know, not even preseason. At this time of the year, you know, we're not even close to minicamp yet. Like, you know, the guy's not even getting after it quite yet. But rookie minicamp, I think it's a good introduction to see how guys learn. And they want to see how fast guys play. When they get out there with very limited information, very limited knowledge of exactly the, the you know, the, the scheme and, and the theme of what they actually going to do during a year. It's like an introduction to football. It's like a, a, a one-on-one, football one-on-one class. It's like, all right, let's see what your general knowledge is and let your athleticism and your football IQ speak for itself. Now, again, your situation was different because you were hurt coming in. But I wonder, after all the training that these guys have done after the season to prepare for the combine, and their pro days, by the way, too, right? I would think... You get drafted. You're so pumped to get drafted, or in many cases, undrafted guys, right? The week or so before the rookie minicamp, I'd want to put myself in bubble wrap, right? <laughs> yeah. I, pu I pull a hamstring walking walking out the front door. <laughs> I can't I can't report to rookie Paul, minicamp if, saying if that I'm hurt, If there's any right? guy in the NFL that pulls a hamstring walking out the door, they shouldn't be playing okay. at all. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> you're that. But my point is... Whatever, whatever may have happened to you, you may, you may have literally like stepped off the curb and gotten hit by a school bus. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're coming the first day. Of oh yeah, hundred yeah, percent. And yeah. you are not, you are not under any circumstances admitting to any type of malady whatsoever. Right, right, right. I, I wanted to perform too, but I, I couldn't really, you know, get after a, a, as you I wanted. You had a pre-existing condition. Right, I had surgery. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, right before. That's a little the different the season, really. than. You know, because like tweaking something, right? Like right. tweaking a hammy, like running and or, well, or rolling an ankle, getting a turf toe, some very common little things yes. that are can be really big. You know, but, I get you. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. I'm assuming, and again, you know, I haven't talked to this new class of kids yet. Outside of the when the draft was done, we talked a little bit, but over the years, I'm sure that some of the training techniques have changed. The schedule has changed. What they're doing has changed, but all these kids busted their butts and we hear all the time from coaches during the rookie season of these players like these guys finally after their rookie season's over they get a chance to breathe yeah. because from the time they played their last college season 
through the combine, mm -hmm. through the pro day. Then they've got the spring drills and everything. Physically, they haven't had much chance to recoup or to rest at all. Basically, since their junior year, if you really think about it. It's been taxing, because right? Because you, you think about going into your senior year, this is the year, right? This is the year where your dreams can come true after this season, mm -hmm. right? And you go into this training camp, of course, leading up to your senior year in college, and then you have your whole entire senior year that you're playing, you know, week in and week out. You rest, not really rest, but you're not playing games for like three weeks, given for the, the bowl game, mm -hmm. if you make it to a bowl game. And then you do your bowl game. There's no break. Like the NFL, when you have a, when you're done with the season, every single player takes a break, whether they go on vacation or they just mentally and physically getting away from game football. Mm -hmm. You're not training the next the next day after the season. Right. That does not happen in the NFL. Correct. But in college, it does, because you have to prepare yourself for post senior year things, whatever it is. Senior bowl invites that come that comes like mm -hmm. really right after bowl game season. So you got to prep for that. You got to practice for that. And then you're also the entire time, you know, at, right after you're done playing your senior season, which I'm gonna say the bowl game. Bowl season is always like you know late December, early January. You're training for the combine, and the combine's in February, or you're training for your pro day, which is in February or March. So even if you don't play in none of those games and you have you know uh, you potential to play uh, uh, in the NFL, you're going to be training as hard as you possibly can as many days of the week as you can. You're going to be trying to recover and all of that. So you're you're literally locked in from the beginning of your senior year, which is be before school year starts in August or mm -hmm. late July, August. You go all the way through, and then you get. You get to this point where you have been training, and maybe they kind of dialed it back a little bit. But what they don't want to do is show up the rookie mini camp out of shape. So they've yeah. definitely been doing football stuff. I mean, and they've definitely been doing you know on their own individually training wherever they're training. I'm talking about these rookies coming in. They they're they've been training and they haven't they haven't done anything. Can you hear me? We having like a little mic issues right now. I don't know if anybody can hear me. Paul, I think talk? so. Yeah, yeah. I, We're I good. Can say good. It's okay. Good. Um, I, I couldn't hear myself. Um, so basically, before your senior year, all the way until after your first year. So that's how many months is that? Oh, you know be, what I mean? It could be a full it's, two. It's years almost, almost two years of basically not taking a break from football, and you're training hard. You're lifting weights. You're running. You're conditioning. You're doing all your treatments. You're doing everything you need to do to survive in the NFL, and you literally don't get a break till after your rookie season. Okay, so to my point, in the week prior to coming into rookie minicamp, you could very easily tweak something. Yeah, which is the last but, thing in the world that you want to do. I don't think guys think like that. I I know I didn't think like that, even though I was hurt at the time. Right. You know what I mean? But I got hurt. I had surgery my yeah, senior year. I got hurt going into my senior difference. year. It's a little bit different, but I don't think guys think like that, and I don't think you should think like that. You know, I think you you, you should be smart, but you shouldn't like not do the things that got you to the point where you're at. Right. You know, like you should still be lifting weights, you know, and I'm not saying heavy, but you don't want to be, you know, overworked when you get to rookie minicamp because rookie minicamp is so hard because you have a limited number of bodies, not like regular training camp in mm -hmm. the beginning. And like I said, the pace is turned up because the guys don't really know what a walkthrough is. Right. You know, the guys don't know the actual pace of the NFL. Pace of the NFL is not as fast as college, mm -hmm. you know, and then also you put in the fact that all of these guys – are trying to make roster spots when you're a, even even neighbors like he's coming in as a first round draft pick okay maybe he's wide receiver number one but he's still never played in the nfl he's still gotta make the team right you know what i'm saying like even though of course he's gonna probably be wide receiver number one but he still has to go out and prove that he was a number one draft pick for a reason you know and and that mindset going into it i just don't think nobody's turning it down this week in terms of leading up to it. Okay. Maybe they're more conscious about it. But I never thought like that, you know, and, and I never thought that I should watch what I'm doing, you know, to prevent from injury because it's getting to the certain point. No, I had a routine, the things that I would do, and I would ramp up whatever I was doing off season wise training, mm -hmm. knowing that I was coming into whatever mini camp it was, whatever training camp it was, it even OTAs, and I had to be in some type of shape. All right, I got some more stuff I want to ask you about that, but I see the calls. Well, they were lighting up a second ago. What happened there, Dan? Did we lose them? They, they saw we the, lost him. the audio. We lost him. They didn't like the 201, audio. 201 939 4513 is our phone number. 201 939 
888-528-4513. Our lines are open again. I, I saw them flashing, and now they went dark all of a sudden. So please give us a call. We'd love to talk to you guys today. Let me go to the competitive factor. Uh, again, the draft picks, yeah. They come to rookie camp. They want to make a good impression, but we all know they're going to, in all likelihood, they're making it to training camp. But not, oh, right, right okay. to training camp. Most, we most know that. I mean, you're, if you're cutting a, a draft choice <laughs> after rookie camp, something's very wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? But, but the undrafted rookie free agents who come to rookie minicamp. Mm -hmm. Now, every single minute is a fight for their lives. Yeah, yeah. Is there a camaraderie? Or is the competition overtake your emotions as an undrafted rookie free agent? Can you be side by side with that guy and not think about, well, one of us could be going home tomorrow? Right. Um, I, I hear what you're saying. That's a great question, too. Um, and I, I can only speak for, you know, the one rookie training camp year that I've had. Mm -hmm. um, and, nah, we were all friends, man. Like, we were all, you know, because it was – Besides Malcolm Jenkins, who was the number one pick, I felt like nobody else was safe in that locker room. <laughs> you know, nobody else was safe. So, um, you know, as people know that their cuts happen, you know, and I, I was mistaken thinking that the the kid that got cut, he was a quarterback, he got cut before, but he actually got cut uh, after rookie minicamp during the OTA session. That's when he got and, cut. And chances are he did something wrong. I don't know. He was a, no? he was the quarterback, and he never showed anything. I don't I don't know. I really don't okay. know. I, I really don't know. But we didn't know, and, and it scared us because once that happened, and now my now the story is relevant because now I timed it correctly. So once he got released or cut, that's when everybody was like, "Yo, they're cutting people right now." You know, like we didn't even know, and he didn't even really get out there and have a chance to show, you know, what he had really. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think he had a, a, an opportunity to really do so. And that kept everybody on alert. So fast forward to training camp, you know, come late July and August, the, the Saints rookies were in a separate locker room than everybody else. So when after practice, when every single rookie's in that locker room, right, and everybody's mm -hmm. all accounted for, and we're all, you know, shooting the breeze about what just happened, you know, in practice. And, you, you know, we're talking, man, talk I caught it. you, man, da, da, da. I mean, you right? got that pass. Like, you know, they're just talking smack. When that door opens and you know it's the guy coming looking for people, like that's a very scary feeling. I believe it. As an undrafted guy that was yeah. hurt, like basically half the preseason. Yeah. Um, I remember Jeremy Parnell, he was a 6'8". At the time, I think he was a defensive end. At the time, there was a guy that ended up playing for Dallas for a while okay. at left tackle. But at first he came in as like a tight end and then they moved him to defense and then they moved him to D tackle. He was like my locker buddy. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And every time he came in, we would look at each other and just like act like we were busy. You know, I've never felt that way in my life, Paul. Like I've never felt like I could just lose my job at any time. Of course, I didn't have the job quite yet. Right. But like once they come in, they grab you like, that's it. And you, not to say you never hear from them guys again, but a lot of those guys that get snatched out of there, you never hear from them again. And that's a very nerve wracking situation. It's like situation being an extra on The here. Sopranos. See, you I don't know too much about that. You're here today and you suddenly disappear tomorrow. But that's the truth. That statement is absolutely the truth. And that's a nerve wracking feeling, you know. Yeah. But as of right now, going into this rookie mini camp, it's all rookies. You know what I mean? And maybe, do they have. A first year guy or a second yeah, year guy because they, they've had a couple they, guys they, like they that. They could have past. some some uh, exception tryouts that right, come in. Right. Guys who have had some time in the practice. Even squad some and stuff right like that. some younger guys who yeah. possibly was hurt yeah. last year. Correct. They want to kind of put them out there just to Correct. get their feet underneath them, which is I think a great thing uh, for them to do, especially guys that are injured. But right now it's a good time to evaluate to see what you have, and then also potential free agents that can possibly mm -hmm. stay on the roster and impact the team. And training camp and see if they can actually make the final roster. Jonathan, the phones have lit up. Yeah, let's exactly. Do it. So the, the phone bank is working. Yeah. We're glad now. You put out they, the call, man. They, they, they <laughs> have lit up again and they are full. So we're going to get to your calls in just a second. I got to read these announcements. They're obligatory. You know them by heart, but we've got to <laughs> tell you anyway. The Giants Auto Podcast has all kinds of interviews with coaches, former players, NFL dignitaries. Uh, we talk all about in long form, uh, long form format. All about uh, issues relating to the National Football League and the Giants. 
You can subscribe to your favorite podcast platform or go to Giants.com slash podcasts. Giants season memberships. Well, you can follow the team all the way through the season with a season ticket membership. Stay connected. Uh, they are now available through the for the 2024 season. To learn more about the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. And Giants TV is the official uh, TV streaming app has all kinds of original video content. You can get all kinds of great stuff on it. It's free on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Free TV, and the Giants mobile app. Those announcements are out of the way. We take your phone calls now at 201-939-4513. The first caller of today's program is on line one. It is Charlie from Portland, Maine. Hello, Charlie. Hey, good morning, Paul. How you been? JC. Hey, well, actually, I had COVID. You know, four years oh. I avoided it. Yeah, I you just got had it. COVID I, in 2024. But, but you're okay That's now. Still a thing? Yeah. yeah, I'm okay now. Good, I had good to all hear, the, Charlie. You know, I had all the, you know, I had all the short shots. I mean, the first two days was bad. But I'll tell you one thing: if you want really uh, good abs and get a six pack, get COVID for a week and just cough. Oh, and I, my, my, my abs are just incredible right now. All right. All right. Uh, this is where we put the little asterisk yeah, on the yeah, bottom yeah. of the screen and say this is not official medical advice. Do not try this. Right. No, no. How it's about not. that? <laughs> That's good. That's good. Hey, no. I, I, look, this would be my, JC, this would be my, and Paul, this would be my attitude. If I was an undrafted free agent or even a draft choice going in to camp, this would be my attitude. I am good. I know who I am. I know how I can play. I know I can play in this league. I have no doubt. And if you guys have a blind spot and can't see it, so be it. I will find a team that can. That would be my attitude. And if the Giants can't see it, another team will see it. And that would be my attitude. I wouldn't be scared. I know I'm confident in myself and what I've done, who I am, what I can do. The only caveat is just don't get injured. You know, don't get some little stupid injury that yeah. they can say, well, you know, I don't want to wait for you. Goodbye. You know, mm-hmm. but other than that, that's my attitude. And, and that's an attitude that I think everyone should have. You should be confident in yourself. You got there, whether you undrafted or not. And if you guys can't see it, I mean, how many players have left the Giants and then all of a sudden, you know, they got on another team and they're, and they're, they're really good, right? Because the Giants couldn't see who they were. But another team did see who they were, or they fit their scheme, or whatever you know you want to say. So that would be my attitude. Was that your attitude, JC? No, I wasn't. I was just trying to get healthy so I can play, you know. And I, know, I, I, I know. but listen, Charlie, I, I look. I was supposed to be drafted, so I think you know I was on all the draft boards. You know, anywhere from people saw me getting drafted as early as the second round to like fourth or fifth round, uh, and I ended up going yeah. undrafted. So I did have that. Uh, that notion, that feeling, and that belief in myself for sure, 100%. But All it's right. a different right. story when you get out there, you know, and, and you're just, not to say you're ner- there's there's so much nerves there, man, because everything's new, you know, and, and like, it, it's it sounds good when you say it, and I believe that now, and I would think that now. I just think it was totally different rookie year. Everybody was just so nervous. Everybody was just so nervous, especially – the guys that were drafted either in the later rounds or the undrafted guys. Like, every single day was nerve-wracking for us. Like, every day. When we put them pads on, you know, when it came to training camp, we were nervous. And in rookie minicamp, uh, uh, Charlie, there's there's no other eyes on you but the team. Like, there's no film going out to other teams. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's not like, whatever I do in rookie minicamp, the other team will see it. No, it's only the Giants that's seeing it. So that this is really some of these guys' only shot. That's true. You know, to to slide on and you know become a, a New York Giant just for the preseason. You know, we're not even talking about for the season. We're talking about just for the preseason. So it sounds good when you say it, and I believe it now, and I probably believed it in year two. But in year one, man, I was just nervous, man. You know, Charlie, scared. just to understand <laughs> what's at stake for for the undrafted rookie free agents more so than anybody else. For those guys, until they get preseason snaps to put on tape, no other NFL scout is getting to see anything that Nothing. they've done since, over the course of the summer. Right, since their college year. That's mm-hmm. it. And and the, so so what we what what can you do in the, in that months what three four months time frame from the spring until you get to August in the preseason games, the only 
quote, football people who will see you are your team itself and the CFL scouts, the Arena League scouts. People that come to watch okay. it at practice. Right. right. Yeah. Because the other football leagues, whether it's the CFL again, or it's the Arena League, or it's the UFL, or it's uh, some German football league, you know, some European football league, those are the only people that are going to be allowed to see anything that you've done until you get into a preseason game. And, of course, if you don't do enough of good things in training camp, you might wind up seeing five snaps in the preseason, yeah. which is basically nothing. Yeah. So there is a lot at stake for these guys. Regardless of the confidence level that they have, they need to, to get their best foot forward to impress the people who are on this property as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah, because it's not and like because Charlie, because what you were saying is kind of yeah, like the the mindset of going in a training camp. Yeah, which is like I'm going to a training camp. I get to that preseason game. No matter how many snaps I get, whether it's ten snaps or three snaps, I'm gonna put my best foot forward, and at least I got some film out there. So if they don't want me, I that's not the case during this period of time. During this period, everything yeah. is basically you got to do your best this weekend. You got what? How many practices are they doing? Probably five or six practices yeah, well, in three days, right? Something yeah, like that. Because not all these rookie camp guys get to even come to training camp right. in July. Right. They're, they're already JC, slicing this thing to ribbons. Yep. But, JC, let mm. me ask you this. Has Did fear and being nervous bring you to the point that you came to the NFL? I mean, was that what brought you to the NFL? Fear? No. Being no. Uh -uh. Exactly. That's yep. what I'm. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Talking Charlie, about... don't do that. Yeah, Charlie. everybody everybody has to have confidence. Yes. You have to have confidence and assertiveness to perform at your best, to give yourself right. an opportunity. I don't think anybody would disagree with you, Charlie. Actually, this is a really good call that you, you brought to us today. Yeah. And I do compliment you for that, and I'm glad you're feeling better. Is there anything else? No, thank you, guys. All right, uh, appreciate it. Go, go, go ahead. I was just going to say, the only thing I'll say about the draft, we made a big mistake. We didn't take a quarterback. We could have. And uh, New England doubled down and took two quarterbacks. And um, uh, it's going to be interesting to, uh, since I'm up here in New England, to hear how uh, Drake is doing and how Joe, Joe Millions is doing. Okay, like, I Joe don't Millions. want to belabor this, Charlie, but I want to give you, give you a chance. Give me a real quick comeback answer now. Which mm -hmm. draft pick would you have used on a quarterback? And Because obviously the Giants only had six. Right. They had one in each right. of the first six rounds. Which quarterback would you have taken, and at which round would you have taken him? I'm assuming yeah. there was well, no trades. Right. I mean, I, I'm a Penix guy. I would have taken him at six. Ooh. Really? It, it, yeah, I would have taken him at six. Okay, so you're on the three. record. You're right. on the record. And, right. that's, and that, I wanted to give you that chance. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thanks. All right, Charlie, thanks for the thanks, call. Thanks, Charlie. 201-939-4513. Have you been on since the draft? Uh, yes, maybe once, I think. So did you have a chance to give a thumbnail on what you thought of the six-man six, six no. man class? Mm -mm. Would would you like, you, you know what, we got, a, we got a couple more calls to yeah. get to. Why don't we get to that before? Yeah, we'll do the calls. Over. I don't really know the guys, to be okay. honest. I, I just got to go off what I've hear, we're hearing from the guys. Because you know I don't watch college football. I'll get, we'll, but we'll I'll give, a, give you my perspective. I'll let's give take you the, the calls, let's though. Let's get the calls yeah, yeah. in first. We'll get to it. I will. All right, let's go back to the phones. 201-939-4513 is our phone number, and we go to Ryan in Peoria, Illinois. You're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Hey, guys. What's going on? Good What's to talk to you. On? I've got a prediction and then a question about some fits for the offense. So, okay. firstly, um, uh, it's been a big yep. off-season element that everyone's talking about with the offensive uh, line. You know, we must, must do better. I've got a very bold prediction for us. So I think the Giants will have the greatest reduction in sacks from one year to the next in NFL history. They had they gave up so. 85 last year. <laughs> I think that they might give up 35 less sacks. And I know that's a huge, huge number, but I genuinely think that they're going to take a huge jump um, just because uh, now that they've got Malik Neighbors, those quick outs uh, will be just a huge save mm -hmm. for – the weak side and, you know, the, the tackles won't have to collapse so quickly. I really think that there's going to be a just drastic change and uh, upswing from the offensive line. I'm trying to manifest it to be too. To be I like it. Yeah, it. keep saying okay. it. We, we talked a lot last week on the show about using a lot of quick game in the passing attack, and that would, that would have a lot of implications and a lot of uh, different 
different yeah. results from it. But let me ask you this. You say they'll have the largest reduction in sacks year to year. Do you know what the record is? I don't. I don't either. But do you I know what it is? I looking into it. I, I have no idea. And I, I think you guys would maybe have more. Um, no, to be honest with you, that's that's for... that's that. Paul's the, the number guy. <laughs> that that here, would but... be an Elias thing, I think. To be quite frank with you, I don't know what that number is, and I would probably, even if I, I tried to get it, I would probably say, okay, since two thousand, yeah, like in the last right. twenty three years, go back to two thousand. More relevant. I don't, yeah, because mm-hmm. the game is they're passing so much more yeah. now anyway. So even if you right. want to do the last ten years, maybe because again, it's become so much of a passing yeah. league. That those numbers are definitely impacted by the style of play that we have we have morphed into. Yep. So, but but it's an interesting thought, and and whatever that number and, is, and keep manifesting, you know. bro. I'm with you. I'm on the same page, <laughs> and I think all of Giants fans out there will be on the same page with you as well if that thing happens. What else you got? And I know it doesn't really matter the exact number, but just a, a major you know upgrade from that, and and also I think. Everyone says that Saquon being in the building, oh, man, he was our only weapon. I really think that it's actually going to benefit us because if you can have six or seven somewhat dangerous guys who could potentially get the ball, I think that'll be a benefit compared to you know it's going to go to 26 every single time. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like I think. Well, that, that, let me that just stop you right there. It, it, it's, oh, the, the benefit comes – that you get to add more players in. The benefit is not having him on the field. Like, you're not going to say this guy replacing him is a benefit. You know, like, right. Saquon leaving allowed the Giants to do certain things in free agency, like sign Burns. You know what I mean? Like, they were able to do some things, but, like, there's no one on this Giants roster that can do anything that Saquon can do. Like, and I love Singletary. Yeah, I think he's a really good player. Mm-hmm. I, I think uh, Malik Neighbors is going to be really good. But, like, at the end of the day, the Giants really couldn't focus on Saquon. Saquon saved the Giants' offense. That's why I saw Saquon. If if they didn't have Saquon, I don't know what the Giants' offense would have been last year. It was already horrible with them, you know. And there's no I look. You can replace him with committee, but you can't replace him. You can't replace his explosiveness. You can't replace his competitiveness. You can't replace what he's done and what he meant in the community. Like Saquon, yes, he was a loss. Can we be better without him? Yes. But there's no player that's going to be like, oh, this guy is replacing him and he's better. That ain't happening, bro. There's only like maybe two guys I would take in the league over Saquon. Ryan, I think the easiest way for me to explain why I would disagree, and I'm going to ask Jonathan to chip in here, because as a defensive player, he knows that when the game plan is being built on Monday that they're going to face such and such a team coming up on Sunday. He knows that offense starts with that guy. And that's where the game plan starts, okay? I call them headache players because they keep the coordinators up all night on Monday trying to figure out how are we going to deal with that guy. Mm-hmm. Barkley was the only headache player on the Giants offense last yep. year. Yep. Right now, we don't know if they have a headache player. We hope Neighbors is. Yep. But right now, we don't know. Waller was supposed to be. He got hurt. Didn't work out that way. So to me, and you tell me, the value of going up against the defense that has at least one headache player as opposed to having none, it's different. Yeah, 100%. You know, every single week, even that the league has evolved into this passing, you know, league where, you know, points matter, wide receivers matter, are getting paid the big bucks now over the running backs. You, it, as a linebacker, when I go into any game, not to say I'm not worried about the wide receivers, but – to me, that's the corners and safeties job, really. You know, I, I'm, I'll probably deal with this, the receivers at some time, especially me being a coverage linebacker. Mm-hmm. But, like, at the end of the day, if this guy that is one of the better guys in the league is going to get 25 touches of the football and it, it, it creates – can take it, it to the house and, on any one of them. And is dynamic and can do so many different things. He can do things in the running game. He can do things in the passing game. Like, that makes me stay up late at night. You know, like when you have have a guy like Saquon, like I remember, you know, uh, uh, playing against LaShawn McCoy and people, for me, he was very underrated. He wasn't at like, like they're very different uh, playing styles, but LaShawn McCoy, he was getting like 1,200 yards a year and he was a threat in that receiving game as well. Mm-hmm. Going against Adrian Peterson, going against Marshawn Lynch. Some of these guys, man, like you better put your big boy pads on, man. And then also because... 
You have to play a defense according to that running back. You have to have eight guys in the box playing against guys like that. So now that creates more opportunities on the outside, and it's making our corner jobs harder and our safety jobs harder. So it, it's it's hard to to like agree with you when I know the value of having a dynamic running back that you can give the ball 12 times so he can rush for 100 yards. I mean, look, the offensive line has not been good consistently for the Giants, right? 2022, I think we had a really good year. I think the run game was really good. Daniel Jones played very efficient line football. Was functional right? year. But look, at the end of the day, the Giants were a running team and it was led by Saquon. Yeah. You know, and that's the – think about the last 10 years the Giants have had. That was the best year the Giants have had besides 2016. And it was basically because Saquon. Ryan, the idea basically is they're going to hope – that adding talent across the board, spread out across this offense. Offense and defense, though, too. Yes, defense, yeah. too, and special teams. Yep. The idea is that a rising tide will lift all boats, and that's the and way that's they're, that's the way they're trying to play it this year. Yeah. But, but to just suggest that, you know, the one go-to guy, you know, is automatically going to make them better – uh, defenses play differently when they know there's a superstar stud on the other mm-hmm. side of the line. The Giants would be better off if they had one. They just didn't have enough support. Yep, yep. Thanks for the call, Ryan. Appreciate it. One other thing. Yeah, go ahead, real quick. You guys have to go. I was just going to say, one thing that I've been interested with Malik Neighbors is that a lot of uh, draft analysts were saying, oh, maybe maybe Roma Dunze would be the better fit. Can you guys talk about maybe how Malik and Wandell can be on the on the field at the same time, and Brian Dable's offensive mind could maybe uh, make it a benefit to have both of those guys um, working together, even though they maybe play somewhat of the same position. You know, kind of okay. how they can mix it up and, and really keep it fresh. Thank you, Ryan. Two zero one nine three nine four five one three. One of the things we mentioned when Neighbors was drafted here, you could actually line them up in a bunch. And that's going to be quite a an, an issue for, for a bunch of corners to deal with. Yep. You could even line up maybe one in one slot and one in the other slot. Mm-hmm. You could do that too. Yep. Uh, Neighbors, of course, does have more boundary capability mm-hmm. than Robinson has. Right. Robinson's really a slot guy. Yeah. That's really he's a smaller, he's a diminutive guy too. He's what, 5'8", maybe 5'9", uh, at the yeah. max? Yeah. Neighbors is, is six feet at least. Yeah. So he can play some boundary. And I'm sure that he's going to play a bunch of boundary too. Um, but the thing that the thing that made Neighbors a better fit, and I remember I was an Odunze guy. You were Odunze I guy, wanted yeah. Odunze mm-hmm. to be here because I thought he would be the unicorn in the room. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to add the unicorn. I always suspected that Dable would would like the better fit in Neighbors. I wanted Odunze. Neighbors he gives Kafka and Dable, I think, a better opportunity to use more schematics for the quick passing game because of his ability to get off the line quickly, to get that separation, and to have the juke ability for yards after the catch. I think that Kafka and Dable like to base their offensive passing game more around that style than going back, putting pressure on the offensive line to protect and then telling the quarterback, get the ball downfield with your arm. Yeah, I think they prefer the other style of passing game of which Neighbors is a part of. Would yeah. you agree? Yeah, yeah. And um, we did our little uh, uh, dive in with the University of Washington when we talked about yeah. Adunze. And doing my research, I found out that Adunze, he was like, he doesn't get open that much. He has the highest, one of the highest contested catch rates in college football last year which is could be really good thing but what that told me is that he's not creating that much separation but when you have a guy like that like Plaxico Burris I know he's in the Bears, the building somewhere today is he he's a guy that he not to say he wouldn't get open but think about his career he had a lot of contested catches in his career mm-hmm. and and because he was big one he was like that big one he was really like that so it's not that he won't have success but I think in this offense which presents a for me with <clears throat> whether it's Daniel Jones or Drew Locke, giving them an opportunity to hit op- open receivers, receivers that can get open. I think Wandell is one of those guys. I think Malik Neighbors from the limited amount of stuff I've mm-hmm. seen from him is one of those guys. And I think you have a valid deep threat in Jalen Hyatt. So that allows you to kind of do certain things and 
and have the short passing game be available to you with guys that are open and not every catch is contested. Because if if you're contesting every catch, that means your defender's closer to you. That means more tips are going to happen. And tips in for short passes are not good. Those are not good. I mean, good for the defense. That's yeah. not good for the offense. So the ability to get open and catch that six-yard slant route, catch that little hitch route, and even go down right away, I think that presents a, a good opportunity for whoever's starting quarterback for Giants week one. I think a lot of the plays that would have been designed for Kadarius Toney will be designed for Malik Neighbors, mm -hmm. to be I honest. Like yep. And I'm not saying they're the same player. Let me make something very clear. But a lot of the play designs, I think, are going to be to get him the ball as soon as possible and let him do things with his juke ability, yep. as I like to call yep. it. Let that be the way you get the ball downfield. Yep. And and let's let's rewind back to 2016, 2015 and 2016, Odell's first and second years in the NFL, yeah, well. where a lot of his deep passes, they were caught five, six yards close to the line of scrimmage. Bunch of right around them linebackers, right in front of those safeties. That's it. And he was able to catch that ball, a nicely thrown ball, in a tight window. But some of them are zones, some of them are man-to-man -man coverages. But he'll catch that ball and make a 6- to 10-yard catch, and he would take it 70 yards. Right. I think that was the thought process of what neighbors could bring to the Giants. I get it. Yep. I get it. You know, again, I wanted the skyscraper, but I totally understand yep. it. And I think this guy's a better fit for the offense. Again, when I when I told you folks, I was telling you what I would do if I were in charge. Right. I wasn't telling you what the Giants were going to do. Because, uh, you know, John and I talked many times since the Combine, and we both agreed. Yeah. They're probably going to take I, the I, other guy. Yeah. I, like, we 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 kind of knew, like, where the Giants was at if they stayed at six. Right. If they moved up, that's a whole different story, right? If they moved up, mm -hmm. you, you think they would have to go for quarterback if they were moving well, up. And then if they moved up, you got to. And if they moved back, who knows, right, <laughs> who, what would have happened then. Thank goodness. But if they stayed at six, it was basically between two players, neighbors and Adonze, basically, right? That's the way it was falling down. All right, uh, let's go quickly. Jeff in Maine, you're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Hey, afternoon, gentlemen. Hi. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about trying to improve the quarterback room, especially in terms of durability, and I think that we really have. I think that um, a under-the-radar free agent signing on offense could be Drew Locke. Mm -hmm. I think he, he's bigger, he's younger. And uh, so I think he's got a, a bigger upside. I like Tyrod Taylor. I wanted to re-sign him, but I, I think he's definitely an upgrade. And But mainly I think that he's going to be more durable. And, you know, in, in today's NFL, um, you got to expect the second stringers and even the third stringers to play during the season, yep. especially if you have an offensive line that's not as good as Eli Manning had. And um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. And also I think that um, going into this year, um, the third string quarterback uh, is, is going to be better. Uh, Tommy when he first got on the, Yeah, when he first got on the field last year, he, he wasn't even NFL ready. They wouldn't even let him pass. And now he's got a full season under his belt. So mm -hmm. now I think he's a legit third stringer. Oh, so, Joe, Shane, um, Joe Shane and Brian Dable have already said that during the offseason that they believe Tommy DeVito's come a long way. Yeah, yeah. We saw it happen yeah. last year in front of our eyes, too. There are some guys who will get a cup of coffee in this league or even more than that who have never led a game-winning two-minute drive in their NFL tenure. And Tommy DeVito got Tommy it Tommy DeVito did that against Green Bay. Yeah, he did. Yep. But exactly. it's a solid playoff team, too. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Um, well, anyway, that was the only point I wanted to make, so I appreciate the show. Um, Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I appreciate it. 201-939-4513. I just want to make one comment that Jeff said, that he said uh, Drew Locke is an upgrade over Tyrod. I don't think that's the case at all. I, I love Tyrod. Well, I his think track Tyrod, record is that he's healthier. I think right. that's what he And he, he did say that too, but he kind of did it at separate points. He said okay. that he was an upgrade and he's more durable. I, I think the upgrade is because he's durable. Yeah, well, you know Tyrod what I mean? did take the Bills to the playoffs one Right, year. no, no, Tyrod. I, bro, I love Tyrod. I just hated that basically we had two injured quarterbacks. A, a guy that who had injury history before in Daniel Jones, not as much as Tyrod, and then Tyrod being... I don't want to use that word injury prone, but every time he's played for the New York Giants, he's gotten hurt. Every time. When he came in what, in 2022 when he came in and he, he had a nice deep ball down the sideline and he scrambled, I think that first game he got knocked out the game. Yeah. <sighs> Can you hear me? 
Yeah, right okay. now I can. Okay, there's, mine, there's been, there's been some static are going, going in and out. The headset. Interestingly enough, the Jets now have three injured quarterbacks on their roster. Oh, my gosh. They got Rodgers, they got Taylor, and they drafted Jordan Travis out of Florida State. So, so you know, they're playing with fire for sure. But, hey, we, we wish Tyrod Taylor the best because he's a really good dude, a great teammate, and a really, and he really can good dude. dress really well. <laughs> um, let's try to see if we can hear Len from Columbia on line one. Or again, we're having some staticky issues with our headsets, but I hope we can hear you, Len. Hello. Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing you loud and clear. There okay. was a little up, static there. There was a little static there for about 30 seconds, but I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Same here. Yeah, okay. Hey, um, I hate to start on a somber note, uh, but, um, you know, sorry to hear about Aaron Thomas passing. Yeah, a couple of days ago. Uh, uh, one yeah. of the, He and Joe Walton were the two original tight ends in Giants history back in the early Just 60s. Just imagine. Just yeah. imagine. Yep. Just imagine. Yeah, Thomas got us through some of the... Got us through some of those bleak years. A terrific player. Terrific player. Paul, remember remember, the, remember the Saints touchdown that they didn't allow in 1970? Uh, okay, no. never mind. Okay, okay. No, <laughs> never I, mind. I, I, Cost this team a playoff spot. Go right ahead. Okay. Oh, I, I do remember that. Once you said playoffs, yeah, okay. Cost yeah. the Giants a playoff yes, spot. Got, he was inside yes. the left sideline of the yes. end zone, yep. and, and Tar- Tarkenton got it to him. It was a touchdown. Yep. Giants should have won the yep. game. And yep. they ruled him out of bounds. There was no replay. Yep. My mom was three years old. Okay, relax. <laughs> relax, Jonathan. It's okay. <laughs> just just ch- check in my memory bank, Paul. He wore number 88. Yes, he did. Like, okay, there you go. That's incredible. Okay. Well, sorry, sorry to hear about that. Listen, um, nice, time of year, nice time of year to be a fan. A lot of optimism. Uh, feeling good about the draft. Can't wait for the season, et cetera. Let me, let me make a quick prediction on our opponents for the first three games. I know we're going to get scheduled release next week. I think we open at home against our oldest opponent, the Washington Commanders. You think so? I think, yeah, I think that's going to be it. And I think we will move to Pittsburgh and play the Steelers the following Sunday. And then we're back at MetLife on Thursday night against Saquon and the Eagles. That's Len, as far as I'll take. Len, I will say one thing to you. Knowing Mike North as I do, and he's the guy who's in charge of the office that does the schedules for the NFL, knowing how they feel and what are some of their priorities when they make the schedule, I feel very confident with a capital V and a capital C. Saquon Barkley and the Eagles will be visiting MetLife Stadium sometime in September on a nationally yeah. televised yeah. game. Yeah. Yeah, That's what I he, said. So. he said. Thir- you, he said Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. That 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 I can assure you is a very confident prediction on my part. Now, is it the first week, second week, third week? I don't know, but yeah. knowing how they think, that's going to happen. Yeah, and I I, I can't imagine that uh, you know being being at the you know our hundredth year hundredth anniversary, uh, not just of the Giants but of pro football in New York. Uh, I, I think they'll match us up with our oldest rival, or the one we've played the most. Um, that would be fine. And, you know, and, yeah, yeah, in Washington. Could be the Colts, I think, too, I think it makes too Yeah, right? I think it makes too much sense. And, and I, I then, mean, I know Indianapolis is in Baltimore, but we get a home game with the Colts this year. I'd be good with the yeah. Giants-Colts opening day, too. I think there's a lot of... That would be interesting. You know, just the, with the wow. logos, there's yeah, a lot oh, of... That would, <laughs> right? That would be a good one. That would be a good one, too. Good one. Now, I will say this. I hope it is one of those teams... Because yeah. I would hate to see Barkley and the Eagles overshadow the opening of the hundredth season of the Giants. Mm. Right. And right. the hype yeah, of, of Barkley coming back here would, would to take away from the hundredth. Mm. So yeah. I want I don't want that to be opening day. Yeah. Okay, let me let me move on to something else. Um, underrated coaching um, signing. The assistant offensive line coach, Ferenc. Mm-hmm. Long time NFL center. He kind of hung in there for eight or nine years with the Patriots. Belichick drafted mm-hmm. him um, yes, sir. here, and I, I'm going to I'm going to say here for one reason and one reason only: help um, John Michael reach his full potential. Yep. Sounds I think good. that's going to be I think that's going to be his job. And if he wants his own room someday, I think this is his first coaching job. He just just retired from football. He's on, probably only thirty years old. Um, Let me see. I'll check on I, it. I, if ahead. he wants his, 
if he wants his own room someday, um, he he can he can accelerate that move toward that uh, by 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 turning John Michael into a you know full time long time NFL center. So that's that's my underrated signing on the coaching staff. Well, that's and, a pretty good one. Yeah, um, and um, you know, Jonathan, most of the off season, you were assuring us that we would be seeing quarterbacks coming in and on this roster before training camp started. And, of course, we got a little time before training camp starts. But are you kind of surprised that we're sitting there with only three and one of them injured at this point? No. No, I'm not surprised. <clears throat> they addressed, I think, the, the unhealthy room. You know, I think they addressed them bringing in Drew Locke. Because Tyrod okay. being, we just spoke about Tyrod being kind of, you know, an uh, injury-prone guy yeah, or yeah, a guy yeah. that gets hurt a lot. Let's say that. I don't like saying yeah. injury-prone. A guy that gets hurt frequently. How about that? Um, yeah. And then you actually have an injured quarterback in Daniel Jones. Now you have two healthy quarterbacks on the roster. You have Drew Locke and you have uh, uh, Danny Cutlets. D- Danny. Tommy Cutlets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tommy. I combined the nicknames. <laughs> I, you have Tommy Cutlets. Um, yeah. So you have two healthy quarterbacks, and that's what right. I, I knew that the Giants needed to do. The Giants need to have two healthy quarterbacks, whether they re-sign Tyrod, which I didn't like that because of his injury history, and then you had uh, 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 you know Tommy DeVito as well. So I think they did address it, bringing in Drew Locke. Uh, you know, was it the way I would have went? Probably not. Yeah. But they yeah. do have a guy. If Daniel yeah. Jones cannot go week one, yeah. You have a guy who's actually played in the NFL, who's young, and who has talent that can win games. He, he showed it last year, yeah. um, you know, to start week one. Yeah, I, I was more concerned about the numbers, uh, Jonathan. No, I, I like not, it. Not necessarily I, I, I the, like it. I like the numbers. If, you know, yeah, I, I like well, the numbers well, now. Well, if, Daniel, if Daniel's not ready by the start of training camp, we're sitting there with two quarterbacks. I, I mean, you can't do a training camp with two quarterbacks, can you? I mean, I mean yes, you can. Will they do well, it is, is the I mean, question, you know, Obviously, right? you can if you want yeah. to, but, I mean, I did, that, that doesn't make my sense. Well, so well, well, well this, bringing, Glenn, you this, don't see, go ahead, go ahead, no, you finish. Yeah, no, I was going to say, you don't see us bringing in another quarterback? Well, I mean, they're going to have at least two quarterbacks here for this weekend, right? Yeah, they'll Rookies. Uh, yeah. yeah, I know there was one for sure yeah. that's reported outside in the internet. Um, I don't know if that was ever confirmed, and I don't know if they were able to get a second guy in. Right. So probably after this rookie minicamp, they may keep one of these guys. You never can tell. Yeah, you you never know. So well, we're not there yet, Len. Like, there's okay. training camp's not okay. here yet. All you right. know what I mean? All right, I By get training that. I get camp, that. I think you do need three healthy quarterbacks uh, on the yes, roster. Of yeah. Course. Or if Daniel Jones is good enough to have limited practices and take yeah. snaps and maybe wear yeah. you know a different color jersey, so he's not actually getting contact. Like, yeah. that's where I'd be like, okay, maybe you don't bring another quarterback. And that think, then I would think that Daniel Jones is definitely going to play week one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if, mm-hmm. if there's any, you know, uh, issue of him not playing week one or him not being available to practice, I'm not yeah. talking about practice okay. fully. As long as he's out there with the team kind of taking normal reps and maybe not getting contact, I think yeah. they can work with that. If not, if okay. he's not taking reps, I think they, they possibly bring in a quarterback. Okay, you know yeah. the, what, the one of the well, I think there's only one at this point, as, as Paul suggested. Uh, invitees to this rookie minicamp is a quarterback from Division Three Wabash College in Indiana. And here's a trivia question for you: Do you know what the nickname athlete, nickname for the athletic teams is <laughs> of the Wabash College? No, I do not, Len. The Little Giants. Okay. Really? Very cool. <laughs> there you go. Hey, guys, thanks for taking my call. Let's go Giants. Thanks, thanks I appreciate man. it. Thanks. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. All right. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left. Folks, we're going to save the calls for tomorrow at 201-939-4513. Only have got a couple minutes left. I did want Jonathan to give us uh, a quick thumbnail overview yep. on your perception of the six-member draft class. You don't have to detail each one of the guys. Again, I know you didn't do uh, a lot of film work Well, prior. I'm, I'm going to watch them now. You okay. know, like, I'm going to watch them. I'm probably going to – you're going to be around this weekend, right? 
Oh, I'll be here. Yeah, yeah. So I'll probably come hang out with you a little bit and probably watch these guys so I get my eyes on mm -hmm. them. And then in training camp, I'll always come to at least two or three practices early on sure. so I at least can look at them. And then I watch what I see in, on film. Because I, not to say I don't care what you did in college, but I really don't. You know what I mean? Like, I want to see what you do here on I've this got level. I got you here. Right. I want to see what you, you do at zero. on this level and right. what you look like, and I will do my analysis then. Because it's not hard to tell if a guy can play or not. I can go in and look at them around other grown men, around other people that played in the league, and watch how they compete, watch how they you know do drills and all of that stuff mm -hmm. going into it. And I can tell right away, I, I like that guy. From one practice, I can tell. You know what I mean? Then you get the games and all that stuff. So if you look at it, right, I think we all – we don't got to speak about neighbors too much, but no. I think the Giants, this offseason in general, I think they hit all of the, the boxes that they need to hit. I think – uh, they didn't touch the offensive line during the draft because they hit it during free agency. Bringing in Luminor, bringing in John Ryan, right? Mm -hmm. I think right. they hit that. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. They brought in guys. Backup center right. from Minnesota. They brought in guys in free agency to hit the offensive line, mm -hmm. right? Now, in uh, and they also brought in Burns to address pass the pass rush, right? Now, when you look at the draft, what do they do in the draft? They hit, I think, the number one concern about the offense last year that it wasn't explosive and they didn't really have a go-to guy. Mm -hmm. They did that with the first pick with a, a guy that if you look at it, he was the guy. If you think about what the offense needed, it was him. You know, uh, you know, uh, the, the big-time receiver from Ohio State, he wasn't going to be around. Everybody knew that. Harrison was never going to be You know what I'm saying? We're hoping, but never. Right. So you added the explosive uh, uh, element that the Giants lacked and especially now that Saquon's gone, which he was really the only guy that, you know, was a danger guy, mm -hmm. you have another guy that could potentially be a danger guy. Mm -hmm. A guy where you come in and, hey, guys, we got a, this guy out here. He's a rookie, but he's pretty freaking good. Mm -hmm. So I think you did that. And then the next two picks, they addressed the back end, right? They, they got the number one safety. The Giants lost uh, a really good safety in mm -hmm. McKinney. So they got the number one safety. In the draft at number pick number forty seven. Yeah, I don't know how he. Can, I don't know how he plays. I just didn't. You know, I I know what he did. Uh, they, what they say he did. Thirteen picks. Right. I, I I know that. I know he's a little older. I know he played for six years. Like I know those things, but I didn't watch him play. So right. I don't know how he's going to do. But I know he was a number one safety coming out this year. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty good. The first round you get a uh, top three uh, receiver, however you want to look at it, in a really good receiving year. And then the second round, you hit a need at defensive back, and you get the number one player coming out, you know, at that position, at safety, which you need a safety. Everybody knew that. And then the next round, they, they drafted a kid from Kentucky, mm -hmm. the corner, which we need defensive backs. The Giants need that. So they're hitting needs. How about the tight end in the fourth round? Theo Johnson, athletic guy. Good we pick. we covered the Penn State and Wisconsin that one week. Really good pick. And an athlete coming out, very underutilized at Penn State. But again, I got to see what this guy's all about. He, I mean, the, the measurements look good. His athleticism is off the charts. Mm -hmm. That always translates well at that position in the NFL. It always does. You know, with, the, I think, uh, a questionable return of Waller and, for me, an uh, underwhelming uh, 2023 performance by Waller. Yep. You know, and then Bellinger, I think, Statistic-wise, he wasn't there last year, but he's still there. He's still young. And, you know, unlike Waller, who has played in the league for a while, and who's on, I think, the back nine of his career with all the injuries that he's had, with all of the, you know, the snaps that he's played, you have a young guy in Bellinger that could play, I think, multiple positions, the tight end, on the ball, off the ball, uh, H-back type positions. And now you have a guy in Theo Johnson who's another young guy. And they addressed the other tight ends as well. They brought in other tight ends. So the Giants, right, they're, they're, they're addressing needs. It's not yeah. like they're just bringing in guys. It's like, why are they bringing him? We know why they're bringing in every single guy that they either drafted or they brought into free agency. I don't know how none of these guys are going to do. We all thought Evan Neal was going to be one of the better young tackles in the league. I, that's what I'm saying. I never go off college. I, I can't go off right. college. That's why I don't focus on college. I don't watch college. I watch when I get to the league. I go to practice. I see them at practice. And then I watch film. And that proves everything I need to know. We're not going to know how any of these guys truly are until after this season ends if they all stay healthy. right? I think they hit the needs that they were supposed to hit. Maybe not the way I would have done at quarterback in terms of Drew Locke. I don't know if I would have drafted a guy or not. You know what I mean? That's a, that's a, uh, for me, 
as not a, not a delicate situation, but I think a, a point of interest for the New York Giants ever since they paid Daniel Jones, right? Ever since they paid Daniel Jones, it's like now the microscope's on him, a uh, very uh, underperforming, underwhelming year in 2023. Right. Now everybody focuses like, what are they going to do at quarterback? I don't know if they address it the right way, it's and we're not going to know. We're not going to know till after the season. No, but I won't. think – they hit the needs and they checked the boxes. The question marks that they had, they answered them. All right. There you have it. Jonathan Casillas and Paul Dottino on Big Blue Kickoff Live. We are here every weekday live on Giants.com from 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time till 1.30 in the afternoon for one hour to talk Giants football. As always, the show is presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Giants. We'll see you next time.